Good afternoon. Welcome to the first discussion in the 14th Annual Diversity Matters Book Series. I am Barbara Velasquez, Coordinator of International Intercultural Education. Today we have the pleasure of joining two exemplary Metropolitan Community College employees, Naomi Mardak Uman, Director of Faculty Development, and Kyron Connor, Executive Director of the South Omaha Campus, who will be our discussion leaders for the book, Culturize by Jimmy Casas. So during the presentation, your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off. At specific times during the presentation, we will open up your microphones so that a conversation can be held among the group. Um, but at any time, as we move through the presentation, if there's a question or comment that you don't want to lose, please go to the chat and send it to moderator Barbara Velasquez, or let's say you don't wanna speak your comment or question, you prefer somebody else does, you can send it to moderator Barbara Velasquez. I'll be happy to share those with our discussion leaders. If you also watch in the chat, there will be an online evaluation link. And if your Zoom account includes your email address, I will email you that link after the event. Completing the evaluation, including your name and contact information may qualify you for recognition for your continued participation during the 2021-22 academic year. Culturize was selected due to its clear and simple messages to making an educational institution address the needs of all students. The subtitle, Every Student, Every Day, Whatever It Takes, we believe is significant for students of all ages at all educational levels and also for those of us who are not teaching, um, at any point when we are supervising or working with our colleagues or guests to our campuses, every person, every day, whatever it takes can make Metropolitan Community College even a better institution than it is. So please welcome Kyron Connor and Naomi Mardak Uman. Hello. Hey, hey. Okay. One sec here. Naomi, are you sharing the screen or am I? I can. I thought maybe we'd introduce ourselves first before we disappear. Okay. Perfect. Well, hi, my name is Kyron. Um, I'm looking around the room and I'm familiar with most folks here. I, I work out of South Omaha campus and I've been here at the college for about 13 years all in student services. Um, oftentimes I, I look around and when I see students, I, I figure out that I'm doing the same thing I did way back when, uh, when I started in student life with Hector. Um, um, and my job was to engage students and make sure that they felt as if they had a home here at the college. And now 13 years later, I feel like it's my responsibility to make sure that our students feel safe, welcome, and have a positive experience here at the college. So my role hasn't changed that much in, in 13 years um, at all. Um, I have a few more problems to solve than I did 13 years ago because it was all about fun. But um, I do have enjoyed all 13 years here doing the same exact thing I did when I first started, trying to create an experience for students that is welcoming, um, um, encouraging, so they can do their best um, at Metro. So that's a little bit about me. Hi, I'm Naomi Mardak Uman. Um, I'm an uh, English as a second language teacher, first and middle and last, uh, but my current role is Director of Faculty Development at MCC. I've never worked in a K-12 setting, so like Kyron, we're coming to this um, from our past positions and our current roles. Um, but I found lots of parallels, lots of ideas that I could translate to my own setting right now. Just as a quick example, I recently worked on a project um, that included faculty, students, and staff in defining what an excellent learning experience might look like. And so I thought of that project the whole way through this book because the idea is that everybody in the institution has the capacity to lead and everybody plays a role in creating those environments that we want our students to learn in and that we want to work in. 
and so they're the same or they're different sides of the same coin right our workplaces are our students learning places so to speak and so we address those together most of my work now is with faculty so for me the question has become how can i impact faculty work in a way that has a positive impact on the student experience so we're really excited to be here with you this afternoon and i couldn't ask for a better uh, discussion partner than kyron he really embodies so much of what is in this book already so it's great to have him and be with him today thank you thank you Can you see that, can you? There we go. Want to try that again? All right, how's that? Okay. Okay, I'm going to go back here. Oh, wow. All right, thanks. So we wanted to start just with an intro to the book, um, Culture Rise, Every Student, Every Day, Whatever It Takes. And this was a, a quote I took from um, a principal that, that spoke a little bit about uh, Jimmy. Jimmy reminds us that it's always has been and always will be about students who walk our halls. Culture Rise is a powerful call to all educators to embrace our purpose, to remember why we do what we do, Casas has devoted his career to making a difference for kids and his passion for inspiring others to do the same. So it makes this book so compelling. Filled with poignant stories from his own experiences, he encourages us all to grade schools that value kids and empower them in their journey. So uh, again, this, is, this, this um, really captures what the book is about and what we will try to talk about a little bit. We won't go too much into his stories, but we will talk about how um, it, all educators, teachers, administrators can benefit from reading um, this book. Thank you. Just a quick background on the author so you know who's writing the book and who his primary audience is. Uh, Casas was born and raised and still lives in Iowa, so he's a Midwestern guy. Um, he worked as a bilingual educator, Spanish and English, for four years at the start of his career in Milwaukee. And then he moved into assistant principal positions and principal positions. He's a best-selling author. I threw up a, a few um, of his books here on this slide. He is a leadership coach now, a speaker. Uh, I believe the Omaha Public Schools had him in as a keynote speaker, and he's very dynamic and well-received. Uh, he won some awards. He was named the Iowa Principal of the Year in 2012, was runner-up Principal of the Year nationally in 2013. He spoke in the White House in 2014, and in 2015, he did win the National Principal of the Year. Um, and currently, he teaches courses in education Drake University. All righty. So I'll start out with the first core principle. Um, and, and just forewarning, you will have to participate in, in this session. I, I would love to talk for 30 minutes, but um, that's not what this is about. So we're going to engage a little bit. We're going to think about students. We're going to answer some questions. We're going to reflect on, on our jobs and our work here at uh, the, uh, the community college level, or whatever institution you're at. So in order to be a champion for all students, you have to start out with uh, believing that all students can. And a lot of times I, I hear folks complain or sometimes, and students are not an interruption of our work. They're the purpose of it. So for, for all of us in the room, and we can go ahead and open the mics right away so we can get our voices and our chat fingers warmed up. And I'm gonna start with this quick question. Um, in what ways do you establish meaningful relationships with students in order to earn their trust? I'll, and I'll go ahead and I'll say one more time. In what ways do you establish meaningful relationships with students in order to earn their trust? Um, the, the mic is open, the chat is open. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll get started with a, with a few comments. In my role, we and in our office, we always try to provide consistent, reliable service and just demonstrate that we're competent and trustworthy every day. 
okay. that establishes that relationship from the beginning if we can do it correctly. Thank you, Toreen. Couple others. I would say for us at the South Express, uh, since our, uh, since we do uh, uh, inf uh, do our ESL and GED classes, is uh, the way that we do make those connections is by um, not just telling students what they need to do, but also showing them. Uh, a, a good example for us is the the password station and getting to their email. So for us, when we do have the opportunity and the chance to, to walk them, or by I'm saying that so oftentimes students don't have the time to even for us to do that, but when they do, we show them and walk them through uh, the process of creating their password and getting to their MCC email. Uh, but just taking the, the time to sit down with them, I think is, is a huge uh, part of how we create that. Um, that experience, that good experience of the college. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. And, and when you do respond, um, just introduce yourself and, and, and let us know, um, you know, what institution you work at, um, what you do. Um, um, I know there's some folks uh, that put some stuff in the chat, uh, you know, keep your promises and follow through. It means a lot in, in building trust. Also listen and direct to the appropriate resources when necessary, connecting them where they need to go when they need to do it. So. So thank you, thanks, thanks a lot for sharing. Um, do you mind, uh, Naomi? Thank you, all righty. In, in the book, it started out with this quote, the moment you're ready to quit is usually the moment right before a miracle happens. Don't give up. And as we work with students, a, a lot of our students um, have other barriers, other things going on outside school and with, with us being administrators, with us being student-friendly, student-focused individuals, it's really important to give them the encouragement to keep on going. I know for me personally, um, with the, the harder I work, um, the more luck I have. And sometimes I've been the miracle for students here at Metro. I, I always love going to graduation because I hear the same story as academic advisor um, I heard students just say, hey, you're the reason why I graduated. And I always respond with, no, I wasn't. You did the work. Mm -hmm. But all of us can be that miracle for the student. And that's what's really important in this Champion for Students chapter, which really talks about, you know, encouraging students and faculty and, and, and your peers um, to do the best every day for students. Because you never know who's that silent student who needs their confidence built up. Um, who has, uh, who are, you know, on the resource at home. Um, some of them are reluctant learners. Um, so they need that motivation. And again, I challenge you and champion you to go ahead and be the miracle students need to, to, to kind of keep going so they don't give up. And the book just talks a lot about championing for students. Next, please. And before we can champion for a student, we have to build a relationship. Um, and I had relationship, 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 because the book really talks a lot about how do we build relationship with students and your peers or across the college. So we can't put limits on our students. We cannot uh, question their potential. We have to make sure that we build strong relationships with our students by listening to them all the time. It, it takes time to get to know students. And throughout the book, it talks a little bit about getting out of your comfort zone and doing some things a little bit um, different, not waiting for students to come to you, starting the conversation with students, having meaningful conversations with students. Um, I've always said students don't care what you know until they know that you care. And, and when Hector said, you know, showing them, not telling them, that's showing them that you care. When someone talks about keeping up, keeping up with their promises, right? Keep your promise, do what you say you're gonna do. That shows them you care. When Tareen talked a little bit about being consistent and reliable, our students need that. They need someone that's gonna be reliable. And, 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 and that all helps them build confidence while they're here. So again, as we, as we meet our students and as we work with our faculty and our administrators at our institutions, it's important to build relationships. And what are we doing to foster good relationships 
with our peers across the college, right? Sometimes, you know, texting and uh, email is a great communicator, but pick up the phone. Pick up the phone and call someone. Talk to them. Let them hear your voice. There's a human part of that. So making sure that not only that you, you know, get to know your students, we have to get to know each other in order to be champions for all students and not just some. Thank you. Um, also in the book, there's a, there's a really, really important piece um, that's addressing the three C's. Um, at our college, we talk about creating a sense of belonging. But before we can create a sense of belonging and get students connected to the campus, we have to understand that many of our students come from the K-12 or come from other institutions. And our students sometimes do not feel capable, right? They don't feel like they have what it takes in a college setting to do the things that they need to do to be successful. And it's our job to make sure, because we have power over this, to make sure that they're connected, connected to people, connected to resources, connected to the college. We also have the responsibility to build their confidence. Mm -hmm. Students lack confidence. And a lot of times when they're in our rooms, we don't address things like confidence. Um, a lot of them, again, they don't feel like they're capable. And some of them are not connected. In other institutions, they might have been labeled. And throughout the book, um, Jimmy Casas shares stories about students that have been labeled and how a small miracle of interaction helped that student be successful. And even though there are stories here and there, those are our students. And we can be that miracle for all of them. So again, addressing the three C's, connected, making them feel capable, and building their confidence are, are the three C's in the book. That's really, really um, powerful because every child, every student has unlimited potential, unlimited. Um, next slide. And since the book is all about culturizing an institution, um, throughout the book, they have these cultural builders. So the first thing that you really wanna do in order to be a champion is recognize what's going well. And oftentimes we do not celebrate the things that we, we, we do well. What we do is move right on. We move on to the next thing, the next thing, and the next thing. And we find ourselves stressed out. And if we start doing things like recognizing what's going well, that'll help us spread the love and change the culture and talk about those things. Because, you know, Naomi uh, talked about something that she had been working on, but I doubt Naomi took the time to celebrate that, 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 that thing that she was doing, right? We, we often don't celebrate what we do well. We don't celebrate the things that's going well at the college. And I always say, I love my job 90% of the time, but I do a lot of complaining about that 10% I don't like, right? And I should be bragging more about the 90% of the good things that we do every single day here at the college. So again, recognize what's going well, brag about it, talk about it. Um, so, so then you can go into the other culture builders. We can change student behavior by changing our behavior. Oftentimes when we deal with problems in education, because we are problem solvers, we tend to kind of talk to each other about the problems with students. And the first thing we have to do is stop that negative talk and really be that agent of change. Change our behaviors, change the behaviors of our peers and kind of move forward in, in having this positive environment, this positive talk. You know, we have to do a better job of, of doing that. And I'm gonna, be bouncing in and out of the book for one reason. I read it before and then as I was reviewing it the last two nights, I got excited. And even this morning, I'm seeing things that I didn't see before. So I'm gonna be popping in and out of the book. So, so, so I want, and I'm gonna be kind of just taking some quotes out of here. So just bear with me here because I, I got highlights all over the place. Hey, Kyron, um, real quick. Can you go back a slide, please? I wanted to say something. Absolutely. Um, with the three C's, connected, capable, and confidence, a lot of times we don't share our own stories and you know how you overcame as a first gen, maybe low income, maybe minoritized um, student uh, or undergraduate, or you know, like I share all the time, my mom died a week before my sophomore year in college. And that was, you know, hey, but guess what? I had a, a strong bounce back game due to my advisors and trio and I, the following semester, I got the highest GPA in my whole undergraduate career because I've dedicated myself to and my studies to her. Um, 
So I just wanted to say that and a personal point of privilege. Thank you and Naomi um, for doing this because I'm going to bounce out a little later to attend the memorial service for Gail Sayers. So, you know, I love y'all dearly. Thank you for what you do. I said, but you know, he's a, he's a legend and I'm gonna be there. Right. Um, so y'all, y'all legends, you, you legends too, you know, but, um, I, I, uh, in Kyron, the next slide you talked about, you know, sharing the good and the 90% and so on. I had to give it up to Barb because nobody um, in the state of Nebraska does the international intercultural um, education the way we do it. And Barb is at the helm of that. And um, I brag on it all the time. And so we, we have to talk about that because, you know, Barb sees it. I see it. I don't know who else sees it. I love folks at UNO, but most of their cultural celebrations and things, it's around food. I love food. I love to eat. But there's much more about culture than food, right? Food brings us together, but are we going to solve some of the issues unless we have conversations? I'm grateful for everybody that's here, but but it should be like 100, right? I know it's Friday afternoon, so next time you come, bring two, three folks with you, and I'm going I'm to mute myself now. Bye. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gooch Grayson. So um, uh, again, change student behavior by changing your own. Um, and, and in other words, if you want to improve student behavior at your school, you, may ch you must change the way adults at your school interact with students and each other. And, and I say that uh, just because right before COVID, I met a young lady sitting upstairs by herself, by herself, absolutely by herself. And when I got to talking to her, I realized that she was a loner here. She was a complete loner. She didn't know anyone. She didn't know what clubs to join. She didn't know anything. So when you see that, when you see a student sitting alone, when you see uh, 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 someone sitting on the bench, say hello. A smile costs nothing, and they can see it through your mask. And I tested it yesterday. I walked around my office. I made sure I had a smile under my mask. I said hi to about five individuals. I smiled and I listened. That's all I did. And I can tell their, be their behaviors changed because they was able to talk. It was pleasant. And we have to do that with, our, with each other and we have to do that with our students. And finally, reach out and, and again, call someone. Talk to our students, don't be afraid. If, if, if we know some of our students are struggling and even though we have you know, alert systems and advising and things like that where we can do, uh, do things automatically, it's okay to reach out to a student and say, hey, how are things, how are things going? Have that conversation and then reaching out to our peers. So just keep that in mind. Those are three things to help build culture around um, your institution. Um, next, please. And before I close this chapter and Naomi takes over, I want you to think about this. And Naomi, give them at least one minute to think about it. When was the last time you championed for a student? And what was the result? When was the last time you championed for a student? And what was the result? So just, just uh, uh, 60 seconds. Um, if you have a timer, great. You don't have to say anything. Naomi will um, start here shortly. So Karen, they can pop thoughts into the chat or just speak up, right, if they have some? Yeah, pop it in the chat. Pop it in the chat, absolutely. All right, Naomi, the chat is quiet, so we'll go ahead and for the sake of time, we'll, we'll move on. Okay, you're letting them off easy, Karen. I know, I know. Yeah. All right, so I am going to move to core principle number two, expect excellence. Um, sort of the, the, one of the main points in the chapter is that leaders don't need a title. And I really want to focus on that because it's easy to dismiss that idea as being a little bit cliche, right? Everybody says that, but then you still have to do what your boss tells you to do. And, you know, but 
So it's easy to be sort of dismissive of that, but the qualities that Cassius describes for this type of leadership in the book don't suggest that everyone's a cheerleader or everyone is telling everybody else what to do. Rather, the leadership necessary to change an educational institution's culture depends on all of us, no matter what role we're in, depends on us staying learners. So we all remain learners. So according to Casas, what would it look like if everybody in the institution thought of themselves first as a learner and then leading from that perspective? So first, it means that we all understand that we're works in progress and we're open to learning from others. We might have expertise in one area, but we're open to learning from the experiences of others and the knowledge that others bring to the table. Two, we don't try to come off as model leaders, but we try to show ourselves as being model learners for our students and for our colleagues. And we also don't try to stay in our lane. Um, but we work to disrupt the status quo from wherever we are in the institution. So when you see students that have some barriers in front of them, what can you do from where you are to help remove those barriers? Cassis writes that most of the negativity, the harsh feelings, the unnecessary work that's endured in educational institutions can be traced to poor communication. He writes um, that communi can communication is communication the root of all evil, poor communication. He offers some great suggestions for improving communication among staff and students. I pulled out a couple that I think are really applicable no matter uh, what context we're in or no matter what our role. The first one is that we have to be organized with our communication. Like effective communication is timely. And this is nothing new, but we are, I think all, well, I'll say I am, really prone to sending last minute emails full of really important information, right? Because I just thought of it and I got to get it out to people. So uh, timely, timely, uh, no last minute emails. And I've got this one highlighted in my book and I might get it on a tattoo someday so that you won't get any more last minute emails with lots of important information from me. So being organized, timely communication. The next one, Kyron's already mentioned this. If it's a tough conversation, have it in person. Right? It's very easy to send off emails, contentious emails to folks and blast it off and be done with it, um, but that's not really great for communication. So whether it's positive or a difficult conversation, I, mean, I think we have to consider like getting up and, and going to see that person and talking to them, or at the very least, calling them. Cassis talks about avoiding sarcasm, avoiding uh, defensiveness, cynicism. These are really defense mechanisms in difficult circumstances. We're protecting ourselves, but they're really counterproductive to good communication. And my favorite idea um, that Cassis puts out in this chapter, or in this section anyway, is that if you're a witness to a good deed, validate that person's good work in person or through a personal note. I mean, emails would work here, of course, um, but I was just thinking how nice it would be to get a note from someone like on a piece of paper. <laughs> and so I might start doing that with people, right? And I have colleagues that are really good about that, right? I'll get a little note in into campus mail that says, hey, you did a great job. And it means a lot and you can save that. Um, so just some simple ideas. And here I think is really the, the crux of this particular chapter. Cassis writes that a positive work environment is the most critical element of ensuring that students feel safe, connected, valued, and primed for success. So all of us working to lead from wherever we find ourselves in the organization, working on being good communicators, working on building trust, taking responsibility for ourselves, following through on our commitments, all these things that we've talked about already even today, these actions lead to a positive work environment which is the foundation of a positive learning environment, which is what we want for all of our students. The culture builders in this particular chapter, um, you know, he's writing for a K-12 audience, but I think that we can easily translate these things for us in community colleges or wherever you happen to be in the educational uh, system. So team resolve is really about getting buy-in with your team on what your priorities are and learning how you can work on them together. So I think of this as that leading from where you are 
but it's not like a hundred different people leading in different directions with no one following them. It's coming together as a team. Booster sanctuary refers to how people feel when they come into your space. In the text, Casas is talking about the central office. So when students and visitors come into the school, what does it look like? How are they greeted? What do they see? What do they feel like? Well, MCC, we don't have one central place, but we welcome students and the community into MCC in lots of different places, right? So we have to think about, like Hector has to think about what, it, what does it feel like when you walk into MCC South Express? What does it feel like when you walk into Juice Space? How, do, how are people greeted, right? Um, do they feel warm? Do they feel supported? Do they feel like they can get the help that they need? Even if they happen to be in the wrong spot, right? We know our students go to the wrong spot all the time. How do we get them to the right spot? And how do we make them feel as we're getting them there? And then beyond the checkbox is asking us to look at how we check off the nuts and bolts of our work, right? So are there ways, so thinking as a teacher, are there ways that I could spend the first hours with my students building community instead of reading the syllabus? The syllabus is important, I know that. But are there ways that I could spend that time first making the connections so then I get the buy-in that I need for people to listen to me on that syllabus? Um, as a faculty, as someone involved in faculty development, in my role, how do I make professional development opportunities that have a real impact for instructors? And how do I model the type of learning that I want for my students in those experiences and not just, oh, I went to this session or I, you know, I went to this development session and now I, I got my $18 or something. They have to be meaningful. And so the question I would like you to think about, um, again, Casas says leaders don't need a title to lead. What qualities does an untitled leader possess that allow them to influence others to strive for excellence? So this is the first time I'm asking um, you to respond here. So I hope that we can get your mics uh, unmuted and I can hear from you. The chat is always open too. So what do you think people need to have to be good leaders wherever they are? What are those qualities? You can unmute yourself and speak up or send it in the chat. I think everyone can be a leader without having that title just by showing that they're caring for the student. But I think also if pe other people go to them for answers. So sometimes somebody who might have the title of leader doesn't necessarily have all the answers, but there might be a coworker that seems to remember, you know, a PM from three years ago. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sean. I just read, um, I did a workshop over the weekend and it was talking about you can lead from any seat regardless of your title. I know if I needed something at the South Omaha campus, I'm gonna go to Shar because she knows she knows everybody and everything who to go to. She might not have an answer, but she's gonna she's gonna connect me, right, Shar? Yeah, I try. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you gonna feel when you go to Shar? I mean, I've never seen Shar be crossed with anybody, so that warm up. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have one. I'm Marche from Bellevue University, by the way. Hi, hello, everyone. I believe. Hello. Uh, hi. I believe leaders have to follow first to become leaders. What do you guys think about that? Think more about it first. I think if you don't have followers, um, you're simply taking a walk by yourself. <laughs> so I, I agree um, to a degree, Marche. Yes, ma'am. What do you think, Kyron? I, I absolutely believe that sometimes, a lot of times, leader, leaders have to be the first follower, right? Um, the, the first person to, to, to maybe hear something that um, is good and then take action. So um, I often, you know, you go to conferences and you hear stuff and you see other people talk about the things you do. And, and then you have the ability now to go back to your institution implement and do something and you didn't necessarily come up with the with the idea 
Um, so, you, so you're kind of following someone else's lead. So I do believe that um, at times it's definitely important to be the first follower. And um, a lot of leaders do that. They're the first one to follow. They're the first one to jump in. Naomi, I'm going to jump out and say, um, I think the, you've already said this, but the environment that you create by um, the tone of your voice, um, that smile underneath your mask, um, all of those things, in, even when you're having a bad day or maybe you've got a stack of things on your desk and a phone call comes in, it just, that's for me the beginning of leadership because that person that treats me that way makes me feel welcome. Even if I made the call to the wrong place or I stopped in the wrong office, I don't feel like I screwed up. I feel like, oh, they really care that I'm here and they're gonna help me. Absolutely, thanks, Seth. Carla wrote in the chat, a positive, encouraging attitude focused on the solution instead of the problem. Great. Thank you so much for your ideas there. Karen, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Um, Barb, are we good on time? We have about 20 minutes left. Perfect. Perfect. I'll, I'll kind of speed through. So uh, core principle three um, speaks to carrying the banner. So you heard about excellence. You, you've heard about being a champion. And now how will you carry the banner, carry the torch? And um, and this quote here doesn't seem too positive, does it, right? The culture of your organization will be defined by the worst behavior you're willing to tolerate. But when I read that, I'm like, wow, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to read this, I don't want to cover this chapter. You know, if anyone knows me, I'm rah rah cheerleader, right? But it quickly made me start to think about what the, what are things that I stand up for. When, we, before, when you talk about leadership, when you talk about excellence, um, in order to change things for all students, you probably have to make some tough decisions. And when you see behaviors that are not great, why do we tolerate them? Just because this is the way we've always done it. So again, so leadership, the culture of our organization really, really needs us to see the issues, address the issues, move those issues away so we don't have to revisit them and create a great experience for our students. Next next slide. Okay. Your vibe attracts your tribe, right? So back on the positive track, my wheelhouse, we're back at it. Um, uh, model positive interactions. Check your body language, you know, and, and most importantly, show appreciation for your team and for your colleagues. We're quick to blame that other department for causing the problem. How about we show some appreciation for all the hard work that they do? And when we walk around campus, I mean, your body language tells a story. So we really have to model positive interactions. Uh, and if we stop modeling positive interactions, we're changing the culture, but in a negative way. And we really wanna keep it going. We wanna keep the positive energy going. I want to keep the smiles under the mask going so someone can mirror me and smile back, make me feel good, release those endorphins and dopamines, you know, and things like that. So it's really important that your vibe attracts your tribe. And, and I think it's self-explanatory. Um, I believe in if you give out great energy, you'll get, get it back and you'll create a, a great karma. So I, I just wanted to point that out and just speak to that. Next slide. And, and I'm, I'm going to take these words because I didn't know they existed, right? Um, awfulizer versus awesomeizer, okay? So when, when, they, when they only talked about a tattoo, I might get awesomeizer. That's what I want to be. I want to be someone that's considered an awesomeizer, um, civil, inviting, accepting, deterring, compassionate. Those are things that I want to, that, that I, that's how I want to be perceived. And it's not in all and every case. Sometimes I'm awfulizer. Maybe I may come across rude, cruel, provoking. But if you've gotten that feedback from people multiple times, maybe you're awfulizer. 
Think about that. And then what kind of culture are you really helping develop here or at your institution? So I really, really want you to think about change. Think about yourself. Um, because all great change begins with self-change. It takes individuals to change on an individual level before we can do it on a large scale. So, uh, we can have the best intentions and tell our students and our colleagues that we care about them, that they're important to us, that we are here to support them to be successful, and that we will not let them fail. However, carrying the banner for our students and colleagues means we will maintain such efforts even when they fail to live up to their expectations. What do we do when someone drops the ball? How do we pick them up? How do we get them back into feeling good about what they're doing? We cannot let doubt creep into what we're doing here as higher education. And it speaks to that in this chapter, it speaks to what doubt can do. If, if you start not believing that we are here to make a difference in everybody's life, and we can, that's when the awfulizer takes control versus the awesomizer. So we, so we really wanted to, to, to kind of address that in, in the book. And again, uh, what we model is what we get. And here are a few things that they talked about. Value personal and trusting relationships. And I'm only gonna name five out of 30. Um, and make sure that you're flexible and make adjustment based on student feedback. Are we listening to our students? Stay active in the classroom. And then try to learn something from a student every day. We talked about building relationships earlier on. And I tend, when I get students, especially students from another country, I ask them about their country. I pull up Google Maps. I find out where the, where the capital is. I, I engage them to talk about where they're from because they got, they're, they're 3,000 miles away and across an ocean, much less in the Midwest. Right? So learn from our students and believe that all our students are good. Next slide. Then we wanted to go into some culture builders, um, acknowledging versus, versus ignoring inappropriate behavior. That's something that we kind of have to strive to do better. And I'm gonna skip to it here. I know I have some notes. There's the banner. What are we doing when we, when we get to that point where we're ignoring our inappropriate behavior? We have to address it at the college. And then there was this 10 minute collaborative model. We as administrators, we're problem solvers. We are problem solvers by nature. That's what we do. That's not all we do, but that's what we do. And they had this 10 minute collaborative model that was, was really good. Get four or five people together real quick. Take one minute to share the problem or idea. The rest of the group will listen. Group members then get two minutes to ask uh, clarifying questions for more information and the presenter writes them down. The presenter then give, gets two minutes to respond. And then the group members get two minutes to rapidly fire ideas and suggestions to solve the problem. And then everyone gets together for three minutes to dive deeper and create a solution. I was like, wow, we need to try that. Metro's long-winded, so we'll make it 15 minutes instead of 10, because I know people in education, they love to talk. But think about approaching problem solving in a 15 minute or less model. We'll save a lot of meetings. Naomi, you're on path forward. Make sure that they know about this so we won't have to take as long. And then finally, tell our school story. That's just a great place to be. Uh, we, we, our commercials don't do justice for what, what all we do on the credit side, on the non-credit side, on the workforce innovation side. We do a lot of great things in our community. Don't be afraid to tell our school story. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's tell our story. Let's brag. Let's make sure that we're cheering on Metro because we do a great job across the board in many different ways. Okay, next slide. And I just want 
time to reflect. I know you guys haven't been active. So now I'm going to faculty mode because I'm an adjunct and I'm okay with awkward silence. So I do want people to share. What is one area that you believe would benefit you immediately if you were to make a change today? And then what is keeping you from doing it? So I'll set my timer because we have 15 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna throw something out if I can, Kyron. Thank you. Attend to my needs so that I don't get worn down. Allows Thank me to be a better employee, friend, family member, et cetera. Thank you. There was a part in the book that I skipped that talked about balance and fit. And I skipped it because for some reason, we at Metro, we don't have the balance or fit. And when I talk to my colleagues, I don't know. We just we just keep doing the same thing, right? So I don't know if it's going to help, but balance and fit and taking care of yourself is really important. Um, someone else, please. Two more, two more. Hey, Kyron. Yes, sir. I really like the idea of uh, your example, not example, your experience with the student that was uh, that was alone. Uh, I think uh, far too many times we as staff, we as adjuncts uh, had those experiences where we'll pass someone sitting by themselves. And if we if, even if even in cases where we notice that they're not really studying or they're not really uh, working on anything in particular, we have a tendency of walking past them. Uh, that's one thing I would, I'm going to definitely pay more attention to. Uh, and, and as I, as I travel from point A to point B throughout the college is notice those ones that seem to be sitting by themselves and, and really, uh, you know, just say, Hey, how you doing? Uh, how's things going for you? That type of thing, because we never know when we might be that, that person that might, uh, that that person might need to talk to and really share something that's really troubling them. Uh, but I think oftentimes, at least for myself, I may pass that person thinking that, well, I don't want to bother them. You know, or, or we might think where, where we're going is more important than taking a few seconds to talk to that student. So that's one thing that I'm definitely going to change starting today. Thank you. Thank you. One more, and then Naomi can close us, take us home. Hi, I'm Carla. I'm at the South Learning and Tutoring Center. I think I'm definitely going to encourage my staff to share with each other on a regular basis their positive interactions with students, um, just so we can try to work to have more of those positive interactions, like share your wins, share your breakthroughs with students. Um, I think that'll be helpful to keep everyone motivated. So. Thank you. And now we can let Naomi take us home. Yeah, I will. Uh, Hector's unmuted, and I wanted not to skip him before I start. Oh, go ahead, Hector. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I, I think that oftentimes we're afraid to like stir the pot um, or just to make good trouble. I was having, we we're having a conversation last night about that. And I think it's just being, being, being mindful of activating or acting on things that we know that are an issue and not doing that because we're thinking, oh, someone is going to do it or I'm not the one that that is able to do this or this is not my responsibility. So just being more of an activator and not waiting for, for things to happen or someone else to, to do it. Thanks, Hector. All right, so the fourth core principle, and really it's almost a summary principle, so it's good to end here, is that the goal is to create a culture where the members of the school community feel as if no limits are placed on their talents or strengths, 
and where their dreams to achieve the possible can be realized. CASAS encourages us to be empathetic, to model forgiveness, to stop complaining, to find value in mistakes. These ideas come up again and again, and you've even heard us say them in one way or another in this last hour. The idea is to encourage a culture in which people are willing to take risks for student success, just like Hector just said, right? Um, and if we're gonna create a culture that doesn't limit students, we have to start by examining our own thinking about students. Casas writes, educators who wish to leave a lasting legacy understand that before they can transform teaching and learning, they have to transform their own belief systems. So he said it's not enough to just believe, yes, everyone has the potential to be successful. Everyone is good enough. If our behaviors and maybe our internal belief system isn't really matching up to that. The job of teachers and staff members in any educational system is tough, it's difficult. And Karen talked about doubt, right? This can all lead to doubt. We see so many obstacles in front of students. We see ourselves not living up to what we wanna do all the time. Um, and we get doubts about our work, our students' abilities, the effect of what we're doing. Are we really making an impact? We make mistakes, our students make mistakes, and we start to doubt whether it's really all gonna work. Uh, but Cussis writes that we can be more effective if we focus on um, improving the environments and changing the environments and the conditions that students face. So like removing those limits, right? Instead of focusing on, I'm gonna help or save, or I'm gonna do something for this student, let's make an environment where those obstacles and those limits aren't impacting student experience. And so focus on those environments um, at the same time as we work with individual students. And I, I think that's, We've talked a lot at MCC lately about removing barriers, right? What are those barriers that our students encounter as they pass through our processes and our systems? And in CASAS presents that really as an equity issue, right? Not every student is going to get a one on one with a supportive teacher or advisor. It's just not going to, even though we want it, it's not going to happen probably, right? Until we get a lot more staff. But if we have a system that people can navigate that's clear, that's supportive, that has the supports in place, that makes sense to people, then we're making a big difference for all students. So the culture builders in this one, and I'll, I'll just kind of go over them, they're very specific to K-12. So I'll just mention what they mean and then we'll think a little bit about what they might look like in another um, context. So student interviews, he suggests interviewing every new student, every new staff member, every new instructor, and including their voices, right? So that the culture is a culture in which people's voices are listened to and people feel valued. The home visit mentor program, um, we probably won't be able to pull this one off, but the teachers and staff go to visit the students in the summer before school starts to begin building those relationships, relationships, relationships that Kyron talked about. Uh, we probably can't do that one, right? But we do know that students, the students that have a lot of needs, oftentimes end up connecting with one person, right? An unofficial mentor who provides guidance um, in lots of different areas. So I've talked to a lot of students lately doing some focus groups, and I heard again and again, my trio advisor, my navigator answers all kinds of questions for me, whether it's about how do I do this assignment? Where do I turn in my financial aid form? Um, what do I do with this jury summons? I had that question from a student recently. So it's not that we need to send them to lots of different places. It's that we need to equip each one of us with those answers for students. So again, we're probably not going to do home visits, but how can we create mentors? How can we all be mentors? And finally, I love this one because I love thinking about how we can maybe make this work. In some, in some way. So teacher calls. He suggests that principals call the teacher's parents to tell them what a pleasure it is to work with their adult child as a colleague. That would be a really fun call to make, right? If you could reach a family member, a spouse, a parent uh, of, of one of your colleagues and just say how much you enjoy working with them. My mother would really love to get that call. So I can give you her number if you'd like to call her. Um, 
Well, we probably can't do that, but we can write emails. We can, I mean, I thought about like writing an email to someone and then copying a colleague and just gushing about how great that colleague is to work with and how much fun that would be to both to do and to receive. And there's probably lots of other ways of doing this. But to close out, and we don't have very much time, so I need you to think quickly on this and either unmute or put it in the chat, but just think of a few things like those creative ideas there. What are some things each of us could do right now to create experiences for students, for other teachers, for other instructors, for staff, even families, if you meet student parents, we don't do that too much in our context. Um, but what can we do that would turn our focus to supporting one another with kindness? Let's take time for a few responses. And I'm gonna, so ideas for creating this culture in this case, this culture of kindness. And I'm going to stop sharing so we can see each other. Anybody? Karen, do you have any ideas? Oh, Hector wrote, be present and listen. Yeah, that's huge. Just listening to each other. I just want to throw out that um, when I had a group of students that I worked with and we wanted to thank somebody on campus, instead of just sending the little thank you, which might've been cookies or something like that, the students were assigned to deliver those personally. And I was so excited that they were doing that. We have a comment in the chat, gratitude for a job well done, a specific separate email, or in all caps, a phone call. Those more personal interactions. Thank you. Yep, fill someone's bucket with a personal note. Hector wrote that, good. All right, if you think of something else, you can pop it in the chat, but I think we're almost out of time. Um, maybe Kyron and I have a, just a, maybe a 30 second wrap up and I'll turn it back to Kyron and then we'll be done. But I just want to say that what I really enjoyed about this book was that there is no room for cynicism in his approach, right? There's no room for like bemoaning the resources that we don't have or the obstacles that our students face that we have no control over. Um, and, and I really love that. That's a really good reminder for me to stay positive, um, and it's not a complicated book. It's a very simple book and it's easy maybe to overlook that or to dismiss it because the ideas are so simple. But I think if we all enacted some of them, um, we would be able to change our culture for the better. Karen? Um, it, it's, it's my dream to normalize asking for help at South Campus. Um, I wanna make sure all students feel welcome all students feel like they can ask anyone at the campus for assistance and everyone at the campus feel the same way. So if you're at South Campus, you know, that's the mission. That's what we want to do throughout the college. We want to normalize asking for help. Our students feel foolish at times. Um, they are afraid to ask questions. So make sure when they do that, you, you tell them, thank, thank, make them feel great about asking. Um, that goes a long way. So let's normalize asking for help wherever you're at with our students and engage them. And another thing, the book is available on Audible. It's at the Omaha Public Library. You can borrow my book. Um, just stop in and you can grab it. Um, so if you're interested in learning more and taking a look, it's an easy read. Um, pick it up. It, it's a, it's a, it'll be on my desk. Just come in and grab it. Um, leave me a note. Um, and that's all I had. I mean, thanks for coming. I was, I was nervous at 6 a.m. I was excited at 11.45 because uh, I, I went back in the book and I just started seeing all the things that I had missed. So it's a great read. All right, well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm just so excited and thankful to Naomi and Kyron. They did a marvelous job. Um, your perspectives were very complimentary. And those books, remember, they are in the library. We want to thank our library staff for all the work they do to support um, all of our programs, but especially today, the Diversity Matters book series. So um, Brian, could you please put up the slide?
I know everybody needs to move forward. You've got a couple reminders in the chat, but we do appreciate your feedback. Um, and like I said, if you have your email attached to your Zoom account, we'll get you um, that link in an email immediately after this. And then we want you to know about the upcoming events. The next one is next Tuesday night. This is one where you need to register. Um, it's done in collaboration with the University of Nebraska Omaha called the Walk of the Immigrants. And this is by Saul Flores, a young man um, who chose to drop himself in the middle of South America and try to get back to uh, North America. And he tells that story. He wanted to learn what it was like to be an immigrant like his parents were. And we have our next book program on the next slide. That The next book series is The Night Watchman. Uh, discussion will be led by Jessalyn Anderson, PhD, who's from the Omaha tribe. Uh, she's a member of the Omaha tribe of Nebraska. Oh, I don't know why Culturize is there. That is a mistake. <laughs> but anyway, The Night Watchman um, book, also would be available in your libraries. If anybody has any questions about that, let me know. But that's going to be late in the quarter, Tuesday, November 16th at 11 a.m. So you have time to dive into that book um, and uh, see what an amazing writer uh, Louise Erdrich is. So thank you, everybody. It's been a great time um, today, and I really appreciate you giving up some Friday afternoon time. Take care.